Thanks so much. It's an honor to be here today and a privilege to get to say a few words to you all before you leave Harvard Law School. Let the first of those words be congratulations. Uh, you did it. I hope this sinks in. You are now done law school. The marshals asked that I talk for about five minutes. Um, to be totally honest, I'm not sure you could get a law professor to answer the question, what time is it in five minutes? Uh, but I'm gonna do my best. Uh, winning a teaching award is an honor anywhere, but winning the teaching award here is a particular honor and for two basic reasons. One, this is a law school that cares deeply about teaching and that's populated by some of the greatest teachers anywhere in the academy. So it's humbling today to be here knowing full well that I work among people, including our own dean, who define what it means to be an excellent teacher. Two, this teaching prize is a particular honor because you are such amazing students. A teacher's dream, really. You work incredibly hard you care deeply about what you're learning. You participate and you push. Now, since we're just chatting among friends here, let me just say that it's sometimes a little nerve wracking to teach students as good as you. No matter how many times I've read these cases, you still see things that I haven't. And you still ask questions that I haven't anticipated. Those are anxious moments. But they're also great moments because these are the times when you help me see my own material in new ways. As a teacher, it's gratifying to see you here today. You've learned what it is that you came to Harvard to learn. You've mastered all the core subjects, torts, contracts, civil procedure, legislation and regulation. Some of you have even braved labor or employment law. But more important than the content of any of these classes, of course, all of you have learned to think like lawyers, more carefully, more clearly, more powerfully. Now, I too am a lawyer, so when I sat down to write my remarks for today, I thought about the project as a lawyer does, and I did something that comes very naturally to lawyers and that will come naturally to you all now as well. I looked for the relevant precedent. I've never addressed a class day or spoke at a graduation, but lots of other really smart people have done this. So I looked to see what they said. What do you say to 750 of the smartest students in the country at a time when you have no more exams to give them and when as a result, none of them has to pretend to be interested? <laughs> Fortunately, there's really good precedent out there. Directly on point are the remarks of past Sachs Freund recipients. A few years ago, one professor reviewed, in about five minutes, everything you were supposed to have learned in three years at Harvard Law School. Rules versus standards, collective action problems, efficiency versus fairness. That's not bad, right? Three years of law school in five minutes. Just don't tell your parents or whoever it is that paid the bills. <laughs> Elizabeth Warren took a different approach and gave students the simple but important message to find work that you love. Last year, Bill Rubenstein spoke of law's promise to ameliorate human suffering. If you look beyond the law school and to graduation speakers more broadly, you get some other terrific precedent. Some of you may know the graduation speech that David Foster Wallace gave a few years before he died. He framed the whole thing with this arresting parable one that went viral, and one that might as well have been about the ubiquity of law. As Foster Wallace tells it, there are these two young fish swimming along who meet an older fish swimming the other way. The older fish says, morning boys, how's the water? The two young fish swim on for a bit, and then one of them asks, what the hell is water? It was during a graduation speech in 1941 that Winston Churchill famously urged his listeners to never, ever, ever give in. That's pretty good advice. But my favorite precedent comes from J.K. Rowling, who addressed Harvard graduates across the yard five years ago. 
Rowling, the creator of Harry Potter and the Hogwarts School of Witchcraft and Wizardry said, we do not need magic to change the world. We carry all the power we need inside ourselves already. So as you can see, there's plenty of superb precedent for what I'm supposed to do today. But what about you? For you today, at the end of your law school education and at the beginning of the rest of it all, what's your relevant precedent? Here I want to say two things that are only slightly inconsistent with one another. They reflect the two roles that precedent can play in law and in life. Precedent, after all, can guide us, but precedent can also constrain us. And as lawyers, it's critical that we understand both of these functions. So the first thing to be said is that there is a whole bunch of helpful precedent available to you and on which I encourage you to rely as you chart your future courses as lawyers. As HLS graduates, you have access to innumerable examples of people living good lives in the law in multiple ways and in multiple contexts. If you look only to the people who sat in these very seats on days just like this in the last handful of years, you'd be able to build an impressive set of role models. You fall, after all, in the footsteps of the current President of the United States, five of the nine justices of the Supreme Court, senators, congresswomen, governors, mayors, and law firm partners. Your predecessors have gone on to win Nobel Prizes and MacArthur Genius Awards. They've become military leaders and business leaders and social, social entrepreneurs of all stripes. But, and here's the second thing, probably the more important thing, and maybe the thing you'll like me less for saying. You are not graduating into a world where the following of precedent will be enough. This is the case because unlike some of your predecessors, you are not graduating into a world of familiar minor league problems. A world where we basically know what to do and where we simply need your hard work, hard work to implement solutions already developed. To the contrary, there are big league crises out there and the people have, who have come before you do not know how to solve them. The list is familiar. National security, national debt, fragile environment, failing schools. An electoral system responsive to wealth rather than votes. A legislative arena gridlocked against reform and maybe closest to home, a justice system that is less and less accessible to the people who need it most. While the problems are familiar, what to do about them remains a mystery. We've not developed a workable means to fix the schools or make sure that wealth doesn't subvert democracy or ensuring access to courts. Solving these problems is going to take invention and discovery, not just precedent and recovery. Now, some might think that lawyers are ill-equipped to do this kind of work, that lawyers cannot invent or create, that lawyers cannot operate outside the safe confines of binding precedent. But that's not true. It's not true because law at its best is not a list of rules already written, but a living thing that we create every day to address the problems the world throws at us. In fact, lawyers are in many ways the best positioned to do the kind of creative work that needs to be done. That's true because the best lawyers know how to use precedent as the seeds of creativity. The best lawyers, kind of like artists and musicians, are able to integrate all that has come before in the process of creating something new. In the end, class of 2013, the world is giving you a graduation gift. That gift is a long list of problems to solve and no guide for solving them. You might think that that is a strange kind of gift, but it is a gift. Because when it comes to your lives as lawyers, the really interesting stuff is going to begin exactly when the precedent runs out. When you don't know what to do. 
When you can't come up with an example of someone who has faced the decision you face or who has made the move you think needs to be made. When I left law school, my first job was at a community organization representing low-wage immigrant workers, many of whom were not legally authorized to work in the United States, but all of whom were supposed to somehow enjoy rights at work. We had no idea what to do. The organization was called Make the Road by Walking. At the time, this name felt entirely unlawyerly to me embarrassingly so. I lived in fear of the cocktail party moment. You went to a fancy law school, sax, and you work where? Make the who by what? But as I think about it today, the idea of make the road by walking seems to have quite a bit to do with the best kind of lawyering. And it captures what I hope for all of you as you leave Harvard. The name is taken from a Spanish poem which reads in pertinent part, travelers, there is no road. You make the road by walking. So Harvard Law School class of 2013, make your own roads. I know that they will be great ones. Thank you again for this incredible honor.